Hi, my name is Janine Bajsbos, and in this session, I'm going to be talking about network modeling analysis. And in particular, I'm going to be talking about group analysis and also highlighting some challenges uh, in this type of analysis. So just to recap, uh, we've talked about node-based methods, and these are some of the key steps in doing a network modeling analysis, or really any type of node-based method. Um, so we start with the definition of the nodes, um, we extract time series, uh, we calculate the edges, um, or the con pairwise connections between the nodes, um, and then that leads us to uh, building a network matrix and uh, performing group analysis. So let's pick up in terms of, uh, uh, let's talk a little bit more about group analysis. And first of all, let's make sure that we understand what a network matrix look, looks like. So here, uh, this is commonly what you get out of any type of node-based method, including network modeling analysis, which is a node-by-node -node matrix. So the number i and the number j is the same usually, um, and it's, it's equal to the number of nodes that you've defined. Um, and so any element within this matrix essentially represents the strength of the connectivity between uh, one node and another node. And so this matrix can be symmetrical as it is here. So you can see above, below the diagonal and above the diagonal is the same information which means that we're not trying to estimate directionality. So the connection from uh, one node to another node is the same, the connection from node one to node two is the same as the connection from node two to node one. There's no information about directionality. If you had a um, uh, effective connectivity matrix, then you wouldn't have, then you would have different information above and below the diagonal. Um, and here you can see that this is a weighted network matrix in that there's uh, the edges reflect the strength of the connectivity. Um, and now that we have this network matrix, we can do a number of fun things with it. So one of the things we can do is just reorder uh, w uh, the, the nodes um, using hierarchical clustering methods um, to understand some of the hierarchical structure in the nodes. Um, so for example, so here you can see that, for example, by reshuffling the nodes from the previous slide to this slide, so it's the same information in these two slides, we've just reordered the nodes at the top here. Um, and you can see that that leads to these groups of nodes um, that are red blocks, meaning that they're all highly correlated with each other. So in this way, you can kind of recapture some of the hierarchical organization in the brain. For example, if you'd um, split the default mode network up into eight different nodes, then those eight different nodes, when you use hierarchical clustering, would group back together and create one, uh, one network. Uh, one of the things here that's important to realize is that this is not a statistical test. Um, so if your hierarchical clustering results look different for for example, your patients and your controls, that's not actually a test of the patients versus the controls because the exact ordering can change based on relatively small changes in the connectivity pattern. So this is more of a sanity check just to be like, okay, does am I seeing the sorts of patterns of connectivity uh, that I would expect seeing? And it also makes it a little bit easier if you, ha if you reorder your nodes, it makes it a little bit easier to interpret the findings because you can look at each at individual regions if you want to, but you can also look at the um, trends of connectivity for networks for at, at different scales. Um, what I'm so given that the the above the diagonal and below the diagonal typically ha includes the same information, especially in particular if you're not looking at directionality, we can display different types of things above the diagonal and below the diagonal. So compared with this image, I've kept the, the information about full connectivity below the diagonal, but now I'm showing the same edges for those same regions, but showing partial connectivity above the diagonal. And one of the things that you can really quickly see here is that partial correlation tends to be sparser than full correlation, which just means that there's more um, values around about zero, which is the, the green color uh, above the diagonal than below the diagonal. 
Um, and that's, of course, because we've removed some of those uh, indirect connections. Uh, so we're only focusing on the direct connections. A group level analysis essentially uses these network matrices as input. Um, and so what we can do is we can isolate the unique information. So for example, if we have a symmetric matrix, we can use only the information above the diagonal so that we have all of the unique edges. And then we can essentially have one long vector of edge values per subject and then repeat that so that we have all of our subjects. And that's this matrix at the bottom here, combining the information across subjects uh, uh, vertically and across edges horizontally. And now we can use that as information to do a group level analysis. And essentially the group level analysis for this is the same as the group level analysis for all other modalities uh, in MRI. Um, so for example, you can do uh, a general linear model and, and, and see and do a, a second level, group level, uh, subject level general linear model where you, for example, see which edges differ between patients and controls. Um, or you can do a general linear model to do a regression against a continuous variable such as um, intelligence or symptom score or something like that. And so this method is, is exactly the same as you do it for any brain image. Um, but usually you do, you fit a GLM separately for each voxel, so for each location within the brain. And here you end up just fitting it separately for each um, edge. So instead of treating each voxel or even each node as an independent test, you treat each edge as an independent test. So you still have the same um, uh, topics of multiple comparisons correction and, and, and everything like that is the same. It's just each edge is uh, considered a test. Um, another thing you can do, of course, is do things like prediction methods. So um, uh, support vector machines or any or deep learning or any other method that you want, where you treat all of the edges as features in the same way that you could treat voxels in a map as features for a prediction method. Uh, and in FSL, uh, the implementation of doing this network modeling analysis approach, uh, which is called FSL Nets, actually uses MATLAB or Octave. So it's a little bit differently, it's a little bit different from a lot of the other tools in FSL, uh, which are um, uh, Unix implementations. So for this, if you end up looking at the practical that comes, uh, uh, that goes with this session, then it'd be a little bit different. You want to work, you'll need to work in MATLAB or Octave. So now I've got just a couple of slides to uh, illustrate some example results and a couple of papers that you can, with the things you can do in terms of using uh, network modeling methods. Um, so the first is this paper by um, Steve Smith, um, which used, this was done in the Human Connectome Project, essentially uh, you relating all edges uh, um, on the one hand, with a whole a large set of several hundred different behavioral measures on the other hand and they use the method called canonical correlation analysis to essentially find multivariate relationships between a number of edges on the one hand and a number of behavioral value variables on the other hand um, and so they found this strong mode of covariance across subjects uh, which was quite interesting because on the behavioral side, as you can see on the left-hand side here, it was driven by a number of different variables, but particularly by things like uh, delayed discounting or fluid intelligence or life satisfaction, all the way down to uh, negative contributions from variables such as um, drug use uh, or, um, uh, or other substance use problems. And on the right-hand side, you can see the pattern of connections uh, that was related to this uh, mode of covariance. Another example is actually in the same year, a paper by Emily Finn, uh, which used um, the network matrix and tried to see whether you can whether you can use this information this across edges as a fingerprint. So if you if you 
if you get given, so is there a unique individual information in this network matrix that allows you to identify one subject out of a group of subjects? And so uh, they used uh, a prediction framework um, and showed that yes, there is a lot of unique individual information. And so you can use a network matrix much like a fingerprint, fingerprint to identify an individual subject out of a group of subjects. So I want to finish this session off by highlighting a number of challenges for network modeling methods. And the, this is not, to, I mean, these are, these are very capable and interesting and fun methods to work on. So this session section is not intended to put you off um, from using network modeling methods in your, uh, in your work. Instead, this is, these are just some key things that are worthwhile thinking about and making informed decisions about when you decide to use network modeling methods in your, uh, in your study. So the first consideration to think about is um, variability that might occur between subjects. Um, there have been a lot of very nice papers uh, that have shown detailed organization at the individual subject level that are missed when you do when you estimate the nodes at the group level and um, you can see some examples here and some examples on the slide and so it is important to try and do the best possible job of matching the definition of the nodes the boundaries of the nodes well to what you to your individual subjects um, and that's because when you the, the 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 nodes no longer change as part of the analysis the nodes stay the same and so if they're mismatched uh, to your subjects then your time series estimation are a mixture of multiple things and therefore your network analysis uh, your network modeling analysis is essentially meaningless. You know, if if your if your nodes are not meaningful to begin with, and your time series are a mixture of a bunch of different underlying nodes, um, and therefore, in order to account for this between subject variability, there's more and more methods that try to estimate subject specific node uh, nodes. So, for example, one of them is dual regression, which you can do. So, doing group ICA and doing dual regression after that. Your regression allows you to kind of re-estimate the node um, uh, for each individual subject separately. Um, Profumo is another example, which is similar to the idea of doing group ICA plus dual regression, but it does everything in one go. Uh, and that, and it kind of um, iteratively goes between optimizing the group model and optimizing the individual subject fit. And therefore it tends to be a little bit more sensitive to this individual variation than using ICA and dual regression separately. So Profumo is something to look at if, if you're interested in that. And other m papers have done things like using classifiers, if you're interested in that, um, the reference at the bottom from Hacker in 2013 is one to look at. And of course, you can also use task-based activation mapping. If, if there's an area that you're interested in that you know a good task for to kind of activate that area and outline it for each individual subject and that's an option that's possible to use. Another challenge uh, that I want to discuss for network modeling analysis is the idea of within subject variability. So for most of the analyses that we do, uh, we consider functional connectivity to be a static estimate over the course of the scan. Um, so we get one network matrix per subject and we consider that to be the 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 edges and the connections for that subject. However, there are multiple reasons why those connections might change over time within a subject. One might be state dependent changes. So depending on task demands or emotional state, uh, the connections connection pattern might change. Um, another one is within scan dynamics. So even from the within a 10 minute scan, um, subjects might uh, uh, have different cognitive states that they go through in terms of thinking about what to have for dinner tonight and then worrying about a presentation that they have to give the next day. Uh, and so those dynamics might 
introduce changes in terms of the connectivity patterns. And, and also importantly, subjects are going to get tired. You know, if you're going to put them in the scanner and tell them to do nothing for 10 or 15 minutes or longer than that, um, they might be really attentive at the start, but they might be getting more and more sleepy over the course of the scan. And so these changes in arousal uh, might actually introduce different patterns of, of connectivity over the course of a scan. And then the last thing uh, that's really interesting in terms of within subject variability and really important are more longitudinal trajectories. So changes in connectivity patterns due to development or aging or disease progression is something that we know relatively little of still. And, and it'd be really interesting and important to start to look at that. And the last challenge um, relative to doing a network modeling analysis that I want to briefly discuss is um, the challenge of ambiguity in terms of interpreting the results from a network modeling analysis. Um, typically, the results of the edges are interpreted in terms of coupling between the two nodes, so um, connectivity or communication between the pair of brain regions. Um, however, uh, recently there's been several papers showing that there are factors other than coupling that might be driving what we're seeing as correlation in the results. Um, so for example, some work by Eugene Duff showed that the um, strength of the bold signal in one of the nodes, or, or both of the nodes, um, might actually drive changes in the correlation value. And um, that's something that we might not want to interpret as coupling, because if it's just driven by the, the strength of the signal in one of the regions, um, then how does that really relate to communication between the pair of regions? Another example of some of my own work shows that the spatial organization of the nodes used for a network modeling analysis can actually also drive correlation differences. So if subjects differ in terms of their exact spatial location of network nodes, then depending on how you analyze that data, that might show up in terms of changes as correlation between nodes. And again, that's not something that we might want to interpret in that sense of coupling, because it's uh, more to do with spatial topography rather than connectivity as such. And so the, the takeaway from this slide is just to be a little bit careful in terms of how you're, um, how you're interpreting and describing your, the results from your network modeling analysis uh, in, the, in the discussion section of your paper, because um, what might show up as a correlation difference in your analysis might be driven by some other information that is present in the resting state data. And so with that, uh, we'll finish off. Uh, there is the FSL mailing list where you can get in touch with me and a lot of other people uh, who work in this field. Uh, there's a book uh, that I wrote that you might um, find relevant. And also just to point out that the references at the bottom of each of the slides, um, you can click on them and that will bring you to the, to the relevant paper. And, and I'd encourage you to read up more on some of the topics. Um, thank you very much for listening.